Hello there, this is a video for Chapter 3, Section 3. There are more formulas to keep track of for this section, but if you've been paying attention and you take good notes, you should see right away the differences in the types of problems. Just keep those notes handy for quiz and test time so you don't waste time trying to figure out which ones to use for what. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the video for Chapter 3, Section 3. This section rounds out the rules and formulas for probability. We're going to cover mutually exclusive events and how to use the addition rule to find the probability of two events. Let's dive in. Let's start with the definition. We say that two events, A and B, are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time and they have no outcomes in common. So for instance, in the Venn diagram I have to the left, Sets A and B are mutually exclusive. An example might be flipping a coin. Event A could be flipping heads, and event B could be flipping tails. There's no overlap because those two events cannot happen simultaneously. Now to the right, we have a diagram that shows what not being mutually exclusive means. The two events have some kind of possible overlap, or an outcome that falls in both events A and B. One example might be that event A is that a person is female, and event B is that they are a math major. Can those two things overlap? Can a person be a female and a math major? Of course they can. So there is overlap. They share an outcome. These are not mutually exclusive events. Let's do some examples. Determine whether the events are mutually exclusive. Number one, event A, roll of three on a fair six-sided die. Event B, roll a four on a fair six-sided die. What do you think? Well, it's impossible for those two events to happen simultaneously, so they are mutually exclusive. The first event has one outcome, a three. The second event also has one outcome, a four. These outcomes cannot occur at the same time. Let's do another. Number two, event A, randomly select a male student. Event B, randomly select a nursing major. Are these mutually exclusive? Can a person be both a male student and a nursing major? Yes, they can do both at once. The outcomes of the events overlap, so these events are not mutually exclusive. Okay, one more. Number three, event A, randomly select a blood donor with type O blood. Event B, randomly select a female blood donor. Ask yourself, can these events happen simultaneously? Just like the last one, you can be both a female blood donor and have type O blood. So these events are not mutually exclusive. Here's where this is all leading. It's called the addition rule. It says that the probability that events A or B will occur is to sum their probabilities together and then subtract their overlap. However, if we know that events A and B are mutually exclusive, this rule simplifies a little further to just the sum of their probabilities. Now it should make sense that we don't have to subtract any overlap if they're mutually exclusive because if they're mutually exclusive there won't be any overlap. They don't have any common outcome. So the probability of A and B happening is zero. So we're just subtracting zero there when they're mutually exclusive. That's how we're able to simplify the rule. Just like the multiplication rule, this rule can be extended to any number of mutually exclusive events. Examples will help us understand this a little better. You select a card from a standard deck. Find the probability that the card is a four or an ace. Now, I just want to take a moment to really hammer home the difference in wording between this section and the last one. When we were talking about the multiplication rule, we were talking about things happening in sequence. So a question like this in the previous section might have been worded like, find the probability of selecting a four and then selecting an ace. That's one thing happening after another. The difference in wording here is that we're finding the probability that on a single trial of the probability experiment, what is the probability that the card is a four or an ace? The question you have to ask yourself to solve this is whether or not those things can happen at the same time. Can a card be both a four and an ace? Well, no, it can't. That means the events of being a four and being an ace are mutually exclusive. So I can use the simplified part of the rule where I just add the probability of each event together. I can do this because there's no overlap. There's a chance that I could draw a four and a chance that I could draw an ace, and I'm figuring out specifically what that chance is in total. 
So the probability of drawing a 4 or an ace is probability of drawing a 4, 4 over 52, because there are four fours out of 52 cards, plus the probability of drawing an ace, or 4 over 52 again, because there are four aces out of 52 cards. 4 50 seconds plus 4 50 seconds equals 8 50 seconds, or about 0.15. Okay, let's try another example. You roll a die. Find the probability of rolling a number less than 3 or rolling an odd number. So we have one event rolling a number less than 3 and another event rolling an odd number. Is there an overlap of the possible outcomes for these events? Think about what events would be for rolling a number less than 3. You could get a 1 or a 2. So what are the possible events for the event rolling an odd number? That would be 1, 3, or 5. Do they have any outcomes in common? Yes, they do. 1 is in both sets of outcomes. That means these events are not mutually exclusive. So how do I figure out the probability? Okay, so the probability of rolling less than a 3 or rolling an odd number is the probability of rolling less than 3, which had two possibilities, so 2 over 6, the total possible outcomes, plus the probability of rolling an odd number, which had three possibilities, so 3 over 6. So we have 2 over 6 plus 3 over 6, but we have to remember to subtract where they overlap. How many outcomes were involved in the overlapped area? Just the 1, so 1 over 6. So 2 6 plus 3 6 minus 1 6 equals 4 6 or about 0 0.667. Okay, here's another one. The frequency distribution shows volume of sales in dollars and the number of months in which a sales representative reached each sales level during the past three years. Using this sales pattern, find the probability that the sales representatives will sell between $75,000 and $124,999 next month. Okay. Well, the first thing to notice is that the sales range from 75000 to 124999 is not just one row of data from the table. The range they've given us is not just one of the data ranges. It's two of them. So what they're really asking is what's the probability that the sales rep will have a sales volume in the first category, event A, which is seventy five to 99999 or in event B, which is 100,000 to 124,999. Now these two categories do not overlap. One ends with 99,999 and the next begins at 100,000. So these events are mutually exclusive. Now we just need to figure out the probability for each and make sure we're using the right formula. We are able to use the simplified version for mutually exclusive events for this problem. Probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B. To do this problem, we need to know the total number of months because that's what we're counting here, months with those sales. So even though they told us three years at the beginning, we need to make sure we convert that to months, which is 36. Next, we figure out the first part, which is 7 over 36 because that is the first data range that we have, seven months over the total of 36 months, plus nine over 36. Those added together equals 16 over 36, which is approximately 0 0.444. Okay, let's do another. A blood bank catalogs the types of blood given by donors during the last five days. A donor is selected at random. Find the probability the donor has type A or type O blood. Well, you cannot simultaneously have type O and type A blood. So these two events are mutually exclusive events. That means that I just need to add the probability of type O to the probability of type A. Well, it looks like there's a total of 184 people who are type O out of a total of 409 people who are donated. So our first probability is 184 over 409. And then there are 164 people with type A out of a total of 409 people. So our second probability is 164 over 409. When we add those together, we get 348 over 409, or about 0 0.851. That's the probability that a person donating is either a type O or a type A blood donor. Okay, here's another one that's also about blood type, but this time we're talking more about whether a donor is Rh positive or negative. They want us to find the probability the donor has type B or is Rh negative. Well, we can clearly see that these two categories overlap. So there are people who are in both events. So these events are not mutually exclusive. 
That means we'll need to add their probabilities and subtract the part that is overlapping. Here's where it gets tricky, and you want to pay attention to which numbers you're using for your probabilities. You want to use the totals for each category out of the entire total, subtract the overlapping number out of the entire total. So here's what that looks like. You'd have 45 over 409 for the type B, as 45 is the total number of type B donors over 409, the total number of people donating. Then add that to 65 over 409, because 65 is the total number of RH negative donors over 409, the total number. Minus 8, the intersection or overlapping number, over the total again of 409. We get a result of 102 over 409, or about 0 0.249. Take a moment to write yourself extra notes if you need to for this one, because it encapsulates a lot of the types of issues you'll have to deal with with these problems. All right, so here is the second part of that handout I told you you could find on the document sharing under the Chapter 3 prep files called Probability Formulas Handout. It breaks down the formulas we learned today using the addition rule. We call this either-or probability because your problems will read that either event A is happening or event B is happening. It may not seem intuitive to add for an either-or problem, but if you think about it, if you're open to catching either sunfish or bluegill when you go fishing, you're likely to catch a lot more fish than if you're being picky and must catch one sunfish, then one bluegill in sequence. Look at the example here. You've been told there are 40 of each type of fish in this small body of water. On one side, it asks, what is the probability that you will catch one sunfish, then one bluegill? Since these are independent events, we can just multiply them. The chance for each is 1 over 40, because you want to catch one, and there are 40 possible fish of each type. When we multiply, we get 1 over 160, or about 0 0.00625. This means you would have a point 625% chance of catching one sunfish, then one bluegill. That's very low. That's an and probability problem, talking about sequence. Now let's look at an either or problem. With the addition rule, the question is what is the probability that you will catch either two sunfish or two bluegill? We get our probabilities from the amount of fish we want to try to catch, two, and the total amount there are of each, 40. So we have two over 40 for each. When we add, we get 4 over 40, or about 0 0.1. This means you would have a 10% chance of catching two sunfish or two bluegill. See how that's less restrictive? All right, a final summary of what we've learned about probability so far. We went through the three types of probability, classical, empirical, and subjective. Classical probability is where we assume every outcome in the sample space is equally likely to happen. To find the probability of an event, we just count up the number of ways that event can happen and then divide it by the total number of things in the sample space. Empirical probability is based off of historical record or experiments, what we've already observed. So the probability of an empirical event is just to count up the number of ways the event was observed out of the total number of observations. We also learned the range of probabilities rule. Probability is valid between 0 and 1 inclusively, meaning that probability can be equal to 0 and probability can be equal to 1. Then we talked about the complement rule. If we know the probability that something happens or can happen, then to find the probability that it does not happen is to subtract that from 1. Then we have the last two sections that we covered. We hit two very important formulas, the multiplication rule and the addition rule. Multiplication rule is used to find the probability of two events occurring in sequence. So the probability that event A happens and then event B happens. This depended on whether or not we knew the events were independent or dependent on each other. If they were dependent, we would have to multiply the first probability by the probability of the second given the first probability has happened. If they're independent, you just multiply the probabilities together. Now we just talked about the addition rule today, which is not about things happening in sequence, but is the probability of having possibly multiple outcomes occurring on a single trial of the probability experiment. It's either or probability. 
This one depended on whether the events were mutually exclusive or not. If they were not, we added their probabilities, then subtracted the part where they overlapped. If they were mutually exclusive, we simply added their probabilities together. All right, that's a lot, but I know you're doing great and you're keeping good notes, right? Okay, I will see you on the next video.